Good afternoon and welcome to a look at your customer journey. It's not a hard one tonight. It's not even a long one tonight, but what it will be is a, a little bit of a journey through, well, they, that's journey, there's the operative word there, a look through the pathway perhaps that your customers are taking and how to reach them at those different stages to get the outcome that you're ultimately looking for. My name is Dante St. James. I've got my new lighting in the background. Isn't it so pretty? And we're going to get underway and share that screen with you right away. I think you'll enjoy this one because it's not too technical. It's not too hard to understand. And I think it's got some really good ways of you sort of understanding what it is you're looking for when it comes to what to tell people and how to advertise to people and how to introduce your products at different stages of people moving through that journey from not knowing who you are to buying to becoming your biggest fans as well. What we're going to look at today is what the customer journey actually is, what it involves, the stages of the journey and how they all sort of come together no matter what the product is, particularly those high value products. We're going to look at the stages of each journey as well. So I think it's important for us to look at it and go, you know what? What are we meant to be doing at each of those individual stages to ensure that we're reaching our customers in the right way? And the strategies that we're doing for that is also giving you some practical insights into the kind of tools and the kind of media that you can use to reach people with the right message at the right time. And naturally, most of this is going to be digital, hence why it's brought to you by Business Station and the Digital Solutions Program as part of the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program. I'll have more information on that at the end if it's something you haven't yet participated in. My background is as an advisor and a presenter for Business Station, as well as their entrepreneurship facilitator for the Northern Territory and Meta Certified Lead Trainer, which basically means I get to fill my big brain full of all this stuff from, from Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and all the tools that Meta are using to uh, help businesses to more adequately reach their customers. Also work with the Australian government program called Be Connected, helping older Australians be part of the digital economy and Google's digital springboard program as well. Because you know, what's, 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 what's one program or two programs or five programs between friends, hey? Lots of other stuff I do, but what you're here to learn about is the customer journey. And the customer journey is something that all customers go on, particularly when it comes to changing their buying habits. It's when they are going to move into a different brand of peanut butter than they've ever bought before, what the process for that is, or if they're looking at you as an advisor, as a therapist, as a coach, or as someone who's selling a new service that they have never considered buying before. This is where they come in to go, you know what? I need to be, I need to be nurtured through a process because let's face it, None of us really like change. None of us really want to do things differently all the time. We find great comfort in doing the same things and buying the same things again and again. So the customer journey essentially starts with the very first time that a customer ever hears about you. The very first time they come across you as an option, they've never heard of your problems, they've never um, understood what it is you're doing, they've, they've, they've never considered that this may be something that they need. They may not even be interested at this stage right through to the very end where they're actually telling other people actively about you and what you're doing and what you've done for them and how amazing they think you are. So that's when you go beyond just people liking what you do and into a place where they actively champion you. They actively tell other people about how wonderful you are and they work towards almost being your advocates, being your ambassadors. It's kind of like um, when you really enjoy buying something, you tell a lot of people about it. That's a part of the customer journey. Even though it's not leading to a sale, it could lead to sales for other people. It's commonly thought that it takes about eight touch points to gain a sale. So we've got this idea that you know, people have to go through a, a lot of individual points of contact with you to go, oh yeah, I am ready to sell. I'm ready to buy. I'm ready to change my mind. I'm ready to change my process or change uh, the, the way that I'm going or to change the, the direction I normally go in to do this new thing that I'm being introduced to. But it actually takes a lot more that. It actually can take up to 30 touch points to gain a sale, particularly for big ticket items, expensive items, and things that are not sort of everyday staples. It's not like a loaf of bread or a bag of rice. We're talking about services that may cost thousands of dollars. It could be a product that costs thousands of dollars. It's not something that people are going to go, 
yeah, I'm just going to just throw away a thousand dollars because why the heck not? This is where they have to be nurtured and convinced. And often, you know, they get really close to a sale and you think you've got them across the line and, oh, they don't quite get there. And they, and, and you need to do some more touch points with them. And those touch points can take place on lots and lots of different media. It doesn't happen in just one place. Those touch points could look like, well, they could look like, uh, walking past your shop and noticing something in the window and going, oh, that looks nice. And then they walk past again the next day and go, oh, I really do like that. And they, as they continue to walk past and then maybe they kind of forget about it because they were taking, they were driving the car the next day. And so they kind of forget about that item in the shop window until they see it on a TikTok. And the TikTok is, has highlighted this thing that you saw in the window. And they're like, oh yeah, that's right, that thing. I should pop down there when I'm shopping on Saturday and have a look. And so they do. They go down on Saturday, have a look, but they go in the store and they might try it on, but they're not going to buy it yet. They're not quite convinced that it's something for them just yet. So what do they do? Well, they go, well, what do I do next? How do I get this across that next level? How do you, as somebody who's trying to sell them something, get it through to the next level? And that's where these lots of different touch points can happen. It come from a TV ad, a radio ad. It can come from sponsoring your kid's soccer team that they happen to just be there as one of the other parents who's seeing that sponsorship on the back of the jersey. Or you could be one of the signs up as sponsors at the ballet hall, or it could be at a networking event. All these different things are what we call marketing touch points. So it's never just one thing. It's not like here, I'm going to boost this Facebook post and then everyone's going to come rushing in to buy my stuff. You kind of got to earn that sort of thing at the very early stages where someone doesn't know what that is that you're selling. They don't know you. They don't know to trust you. They don't understand you. They don't really even know if they need this thing at all. That's when you go, well, that's when I need to spend a little bit of time doing a little bit more than just simply advertising to people. What I now want to do is to go a bit further than that and kind of introduce them to many reasons why they might consider buying this rather than just go, hey, buy my stuff. It's spending some time getting to know them, spending some time uh, digitally, I suppose, reaching out to them through email and reaching out through through Facebook posts and Facebook groups or TikToks or seeing them at networking functions, being able to continue that relationship. I know that, for instance, like sometimes some of the more expensive things I sell, like websites or social media strategies, some of those things can take a year and a half for someone to convert from the first time they've come across me. They may have met me at a networking function and we got on really well, but we didn't really get to a sale because that's not what it's about at a networking function. I'm more concerned about them at least knowing who I am and what I do so that when they come across someone who needs that or they themselves need it, they'll remember me and they'll be able to approach me sometime later. And this is exactly what happened with a recent uh, really big contract. I landed the website, I landed their social media. I've landed um, a whole lot of coaching sessions with them. We're talking about thousands of dollars here. Great contract to land. But I first met this client a year and a half ago at a networking function. And so I wouldn't have thought that it would take an hour, like a year and a half, 18 months to convert that to a sale. But what I did, I kept running into him at a networking function. He interacts with my LinkedIn posts. He interacts with my Facebook posts. He's seen me in events where he's happened to be you know, an attendee at that event. And he's seen me, you know, uh, heard me on the radio as I've done interviews on the radio with the local jocks and telling him about the you know, business oriented stuff as I tend to do. And then when he finally went, oh, I need that thing. Remember that guy and I keep meeting, I keep running into him. Let me Google him. And they found me really, really easy. That Dante guy. It's a good thing I've got an easy to remember name. So he was able to Google me, find me, and then reach out and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about this. We had the conversation. Boom. There we go. 18 months later, a big contract. So this stuff does happen. It doesn't always happen with a month or with a week or two weeks or even three months sometimes. It's a year and a half to turn that thing over. And for big ticket items, that's often what it can be. They don't really need this thing straight away. Well, at least they don't think they do need it. But when they finally do need it, when it hurts enough in their business that their website's crappy, that their um, you know, whatever it is you happen to do, that what you help fix hurts them enough now, they finally go, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to step over the line. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to buy this thing or, or get this service from this person who I now know, like, and trust. And that's part of the customer journey is taking someone from knowing you 
to liking you through to trusting you. That's a big journey to take. It's not something to take you know, lightly. And there's nothing random about that journey either. Well, at least there shouldn't be. If it's a random journey, it means you're probably not doing your job and you need to go a little bit nicer. Like you need to go a bit harder on trying to work out who it is you are and, and how that relates to them or how to reach them in some kind of way. And what you need to do with that doing that is, is create a plan. Because a journey, you need to know where it's going to take you. You want to know like exactly what that journey is. For me, it's to eventually get someone to buy one of my big ticket items, preferably a coaching package, because that's my highest margin thing, because it only involves my time. It doesn't involve me then having to get other people to help out with things like websites or with social media posting or any of that kind of thing. Anything that's strategy, anything that's training and coaching is high margin for me. So naturally, it's my most expensive thing. And it's what I love to get people to buy because I really enjoy doing the work but it also makes me great money. And I think we all like money being business owners, huh? So with that journey, it's, you want to define what that journey looks like and how they're going to reach you and go through each one of those steps to go through that journey. And what we'll do is explore what that journey looks like in a second. We need to map it out. By mapping out that journey, we say, you're going to enter into my relevant sphere here. And then I want you to go all the way through that journey to finally buy from me. It may happen in a week. It may happen in a couple of days or like me it may have taken a year and a half you just never quite know what it's going to be like so the reason why you want to map out that journey is because you want to be able to meet or exceed your customers expectations and you don't do that by just being reactive you don't do that just by being um, you know, random about it and going, oh, I'm just going to put my intentions out there to the universe and the universe will randomly bring people to me. I'm sorry, but, you know, as the proverb says, you know, um, you know, trust, 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 Maha, trust Allah, but tie your camel first. So the idea is that, you know, you can trust the universe and all that, but I want a little bit more control over that. The universe kind of works on its own scale. It kind of works on its own timeline. I want to kind of, you know, hurry things along a little bit. So to meet those customer expectations, that's a hard word to say this late in the afternoon. You want to also give them a seamless, positive experience. And that's something you do by design. It's not something that happens randomly. You don't just have, you know, a 16 year old checkout person uh, being so friendly and so nice if they're not trained that way. I don't know if you've noticed, and, and I, I shop a lot at Coles, um, and you know, I, I sort of backwards and forwards between Woolies and Coles, but I tend to go to Coles a lot lately. And I've noticed that something's been happening. Something's changed about them, that the, the checkout staff I've been talking to, they're amazing. I don't usually go through the checkouts. I usually go through the self-checkout because I don't like people, <laughs> funnily enough. But in that case, I've noticed that they've been a lot friendlier and they've made it a lot more seamless. And the last three times I've been in Coles, the minute that more than one person was waiting in a checkout line, they came and brought someone in and opened up a new checkout. I'm like, what's going on there? They've made it a more seamless, positive experience. Now, Aldi does this a lot. When I've been in Southern states and been to Aldi, I've noticed they do this a lot, is that once they start to see a lineup, they get people into that so they can make that a seamless, positive experience. Well, as positive as throwing your groceries at you to bag yourself can be, but you get the, the idea that I haven't noticed that with Coles before, but they've really been doing it a lot lately as far as I've noticed. And it created that. It met my expectations. It gave me a seamless, positive experience. And they do that by optimizing each of the touch points. Their touch point with me at the checkout has been optimized to a point where there's always someone watching what the crowd is doing. So they can go quick, get someone over on checkout three, open it up and get it moving. Fantastic idea to be able to move people around that much. Now they did it at the um, the Coolalinga Coles. Well, I was there about a week and a half ago. Did it at the Darwin City Coles. I was just at, and the North Lakes Coles. I was at today. So it's something that it's something that's happening with them. They've deliberately decided to optimize each of those touch points. So we have got to think about what our touch points are, not just at the point of sale. I'm talking about every touch point along the way, optimizing it so it's a nice, seamless experience. It could start from a networking function where you've got a business card that actually lets you write a note on the back of it that lets someone not just contact you, but remind them of why they should contact you. I say, let's discuss your website on the back of the business card. So it optimizes that point where they've got a business card in their pocket. They pull it out and go, who is that guy? And they flip it over. Oh, that's the website guy. So you're, you're not just 
um, you know, giving them a prompt, you're optimizing that touch point. And the next part of your touch point could be they go to your website to check out what's going on. So you could have like a special landing page that you point people to that's not just your general website that says, you know, it could be dantesandjames.com forward slash network. And you go there and it's like, and I'll say specifically to them, hey, we caught up at this net at a networking function recently. And I want to say thank you for taking my card and thank you so much for, you know, having a chat with me. Um, while this might be just a web page, the person behind it really wants to catch up with you again and maybe ch- discuss what your website's like. Here's some ideas we may have, but you know what? Let's book in 15 minutes to have a free chat. That's optimizing that touch point along the way. So not only did I optimize my business card touch point, I optimized my landing page touch point. When you start to think of it like this, there's some such simple things you can do to optimize each of those touch points to make it a little bit more, I don't know, easy for people to deal with you. So I don't know about you. If you're if you're running a service business, in this country, we have this, we have this attitude that we make it as hard as we possibly can for people to work with us. I find that particularly with digital marketing agencies and and website designers and graphic designers. We're like, we're just really hard to deal with. We make it as hard as possible for people to work with us. We make them jump through hoops and go through sales funnels. And so all they want to do is talk to someone. That's why like all across my websites, the thing I go, book your 15 minute call with me, book, book, book. So people will book that time with me and find it easy to deal with me. They won't have to any sort of friction. They can just easily just jump to where they want to jump to. So optimizing each touch point, I've labored on that point, but it is so important. That's why you want to map out this journey because you want the opportunity to do that and to continually improve that process. My, what I find is that along my processes, usually my follow-up is terrible. My, um, my making sure I'd send emails that are saying in an sand, um, finishing things on time the way I said I would, that's my, that's my weak point. So that's where I need to continually improve those processes, following up after networking functions, getting all these business cards that are sitting at my desk here and actually following up on them rather than letting them just sit here. Because a couple of people I've seen and I'm going, yeah, I haven't seen you since October last year. We need to catch up, Mr. Terracorp. Um, Connie over here on, on the same page consulting. I need to see her. We haven't caught up for a while. I need to have a chat with her. Belinda, I haven't done any follow-up since I saw her in Alice Springs. Gavin, I've been promising to catch up with him for six months. I need to catch up with this guy. He makes jewelry. It's absolutely beautiful. And I've got his business card here right here on my desk and I have done nothing to follow up. So it just goes to show you that I haven't quite optimized all my touch points yet to improve that process. So I need to do some work on that. Maybe a good idea to get off this webinar a little bit later and actually follow up those emails, huh? So you'll find there's always room to improve. And it's important for you to have some control over all this because it allows you to plan what's coming into your business. There's nothing worse than having a huge rush of work and then nothing. You know, having a wet season and a dry season or flood and famine, as we often think of it as, what you want to be able to do is plan things better. So, okay, I know it's going to be quiet during this time, which allows me to go away and have a break. Then when I get back, I know it's going to be a lot busier. So I'm ready for that. We want to be able to have that predictability in our businesses. But to do that, we've got to have a bit of control. We need to control the journey that the customer goes on, not by you know physically placing them in front of certain things and going, hey, I've got control over you. It's not quite that basic. It's more more about having a process that they can follow, a pathway you can send them through. Say, for instance, you post something on social media, you're planning for that person to see that and move on to the next thing. All you really need to do is just make sure that you have somewhere for them to go, some next step they're going to go through to. And then you want to have some kind of way of progressing them. My progression usually starts with something like um, putting them into uh, seeing who, who I am and what I'm like, and then having somewhere for them to go next. So it could be a social media post where I'm talking about um, personal branding. And then I give them somewhere to go next, which is my free personal branding mini course. So I've always got somewhere for them to go next. You start up with what is called spoke content and you send them to your hub content, like a wheel. Yeah, you've got hub content and all these spokes coming out. I could have a mini course, which is my hub content. And I could have 15 different social media post types on different networks that all point through to it. The important thing is though, all those spokes all point to something which goes deeper. The social media can't go that, you can't really go that deep. You've got to be very shallow. You've got to be a little bit quick 
and efficient. But when you say, okay, you can read more about it here, it's drawing people off to where you can display your expertise or where you can say, here's more information about this thing I sell. Here's more information about the product. So you can move them along, progress them along the process from what we call awareness through to consideration. And you'll see what that looks like in just a second. It also allows us to nudge people forward. You know, it's like, hey, come on, it's time to move across. You know, we've been talking for a while. We're going to nudge you over the next level of our relationship. Just like a relationship, we start off not really knowing each other, but eventually we can get to the point where we go, hey, haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. You want to catch up for a dinner? And then, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I've just been really busy. I'm like that with dating. I'm terrible at dating. I just completely get so absorbed in what I'm doing with business and life and work that when it comes to dating, it's like, oh, yeah, we should catch up. We haven't seen each other for two weeks. I'm so sorry. I need that nudging occasionally. Um, same with going and seeing my parents and, and family issues. I often need that nudging, sometimes a little bit oblivious. So that we know why it's important. So what are those stages now that we're going to go down? The stages of the customer journey. It starts off with what we call awareness, moves through to consideration, then conversion. Then it finally goes around to loyalty and advocacy. What do all these fancy schmancy words mean? Well, what they basically mean is you move from not knowing you through to not just knowing you and liking you, but actually recommending you to others. And awareness, this is where they first become aware of who you are and what you do. That first point of contact where they have no idea who you are and what you do, but now they do. They've just learned who you are and what you do. And it may be a vague thing in passing. They saw a billboard. They saw, um, they, they, were having, they overheard a conversation in a cafe where you were. Um, they might have uh, seen you on the television, on the radio, heard you on the radio, or, or seen something like a boosted post come across them in Facebook or, or an Instagram. Or could have been that they saw your TikTok, you're dancing to something fancy, and they thought, oh, I like the way she dances <laughs> probably not something like that but you understand what i mean it's the first time they come across you the first time they ever considered that this might be something that they're interested in so it gives them was a very very basic understanding of who you are and what you do there's no details or great depth in that there's certainly no um deep knowledge of what it is you do and it's certainly not at that point where it necessarily makes them want to have what you're trying to sell but it gives them that basic understanding, that basic depth of what it is you do and what you are, and maybe a little bit of an idea for the first time about what makes you different. They didn't know this before, but now they might have a little bit of a, of a guess about what makes you different. So this stage could be anything from, oh gosh, it could be, you know, it could be from advertising, could be from ads they've seen, or Facebook ads or YouTube ads or ads on TV, radio, or in the local newspaper, or a flyer in the letterbox, those things are still good. It could have been something they saw on social media that someone actually recommended them. And that's where we get to the last point of all this, the advocacy, where one of your advocates, one of your ambassadors, one of your fans, one of your previous customers has recommended you. Could be that. Could be just walking on past your shop on the street, somewhere where they go, oh, okay, um, I recognize that. That looks really cool. I'd like to find out more eventually. At the awareness stage, very few people are ever at the point where they're ready to buy or commit to anything. It's just that they're, it's like going shopping for a car, going to a website and seeing that car isn't going to make you want to buy that car straight away. What you're going to want to do is take that information onto the next stage, which is called consideration. And consideration is where they're evaluating what it is you do, not just having just found out and then suddenly wanting to buy. What they're now doing is going, well, I want to buy a car. I'm, I'm certain on that. I wasn't certain on that before, but now I am. And you're part of that. You, you've helped feed their hunger for a new car. And they've gone, but I don't know what car I want to buy. I don't know what, what model, what color, what options I want to do. I'm not there yet. So what I'm going to do is ask a few questions of this company. How do they meet my needs? Um, do they have a good reputation? Do they think, do I think they'll deliver? So people will look at things like, well, you know, Toyota is a trustworthy brand and Mazda is a trustworthy brand. And back in the eighties, Hyundai was just like one of the worst brands. You never wanted to buy their cars, but now they're pretty reliable and pretty, pretty fancy. And they've become quite expensive too, where they were the cheap option back in the eighties. So now we look at them as, you know, not quite a prestige brand, but they're right up there 
there with Toyota and and uh, and Ford and, and and Mazda who and Mazda themselves were a cheap rubbish company of cut a brand of cars back in the eighties, but now they're like a really kind of not high end, but they're certainly getting up there. You trust a Mazda car? One of the best cars I ever owned was a Mazda three. I miss that car. It was an amazing car. It ran and ran and ran and ran, and it was just beautiful the way it drove. So you ask yourself. You know, do you have a good reputation? Do you think you're able to deliver? This is where you deliver that information to people through various different channels, like your website, making sure the information on your website is not just up to date, but it's full of reasons why someone might want to consider buying your product or ordering your service or working with you. So you've got to have a little bit more than the average. On the weekend, I met with a guy, bunch of guys who have an IT service. Um, they just started it in the, in the last month and they're advertising. It's, it looks like everyone else's advertising when it comes to, and their website looks like every other IT company. So there's nothing that's different about them. So I go to the website, all I'm seeing is lists of things, but no benefits, no, no way of saying, this is why you as a small business, Dante, might want to work with us. No point of difference, nothing that tells me that they're any different to everyone else. So what I assume is that a couple of those IT companies I've ever had some dealings with before and realized how expensive they were, I'm assuming now that these guys are too, which is not the case. They're actually about half the price of the other guys. They've got lower overhead, so they pass those savings on. I wouldn't know that though because they don't put their pricing on the site. They don't have any sort of point of difference that says that they might be a bit cheaper. They don't have any information that makes them look different to any other provider. So you assume then they're the same as everybody else until you have some information to work on. And that could come from educational posts on their Facebook, educational posts on their LinkedIn. It could come from the research you're doing into them. You happen to come across this one review that was on Google that someone wrote something amazing about them and you go, huh, Okay, that's not on their website, but that does sound pretty good. It's a process of research, a process where they go looking for all the different things that may make <clears throat> you just a little bit different to every other face in the crowd that they're considering spending their money on right now. And that becomes particularly important when people are looking to spend a lot of money. Generally, anything over $100, people tend to go through this whole process of awareness, consideration, and then finally what we call conversion. And conversion is pretty much the happy ending that comes from those positive experience that the people have had in the previous stages. They've had such a great experience of getting to know you, of understanding who you are, why you should choose them, and why they um, you know, why, why they would want to move forward and, and be committing to a service or buying a product. Uh, they then move on to purchasing. They, and this is where you get to address any final concerns they may have. Now, you don't necessarily have to do this by getting on the phone with them. It's quite often that they go to the website, they see something you've posted on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, even TikTok, that takes away their fears. It gives them reassurance that what's about to happen is going to be the right thing for them. They're not going to get buyer's remorse. We don't want buyer's remorse from our customers. We want them to feel good about working with us. So we may do things like offering incentives that might be discounts or a little small gifts or maybe buy this week and you get this extra thing. We'll offer little little incentives, little sweeteners to sweeten the pot to get them to buy it. So it's like the um the the car the car salesperson who throws in tinted windows just to get that sale across. You weren't originally going to buy tinted windows, but he offered, and you're like, well, oh, that's pretty good deal. That's a few hundred dollars there for nothing. I'll take it. And so they'll go ahead and do that particular thing. Looking at painless purchase process. This is one of the great things that goes wrong on a lot of people's websites. They make it so hard to buy from you. Oh my Lord, the amount of things they want to do, like, um, you know, to, to, to type in anti-spam things. So like pick the bicycles in this or look for the taxis or the bridges in this. So we, we value our customers so much that we get them to look and recognize bridges in some kind of puzzle just so they can move on to purchase from us. Or what they do is we, we, we in our shopping carts, we decide that we want them to answer 30 questions in order to get something to them. Oh my goodness. We don't plug in the payment providers that are familiar like Stripe and PayPal and, you know, 
Shopify and those things that people are used to paying from, but they feel safe paying from. Why well, we make it really hard because we got this custom designed website we got from um, from Bangladesh, and we decided that was where because it was like about two thousand dollars cheaper to do it through them. Um, we decided to do that, but we don't realize they're putting some custom shopping cart that's really hard for people to use. And what we've done is put our needs to save money first, and their need to purchase in a really seamless way and a really painless way second. And so then we realize, oh, we need to go back and optimize that part of the process, optimize that touch point at the most important touch point, which is the point of sales. You don't want to make it hard for people to purchase stuff from you. What you want to do is make sure that it's very clear how people will purchase from you, whether it's a product that they buy online or it's an appointment that they book with you online or some way, make it really abundantly clear. And to get clear on what that is, there's a book that I recommend highly. And some of you have been in my, my webinars before, and I recommend this book quite freely. It's called uh, Building a Story Brand <clears throat> by a guy called Donald Miller. Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And it's all about clarity of message and clarity of how to go from someone just getting to know you through to that point of purchase. And what it does with all that is making sure you have clear pathways forward, a clear pathway to someone to be able to purchase, to book you, to move to the next let step with you, making it bleedingly obvious where they go next. And then also having an ability and an availability to answer questions for people. That means man, having your, your Facebook page, you know, available through your phone so you can answer questions coming through Messenger, um, through, your, through your page inbox. Having guarantees and warranties is very important to people. If you've got a physical product, they will want to know, well, is there a warranty on this? Oh, 12 months? Yeah, that's fair enough. Or you go, oh, I've got two years. Oh, that's, that's above the normal. Or it could be a some kind of guarantee of you know what they can expect by working with you. So those guarantees don't necessarily have to be in the form of you're going to be making twenty thousand dollars extra per year if you work with me. It could be more visceral than that. I mean, what I mean by that is you will be ten percent happier than what you were, and you know wouldn't it be worth it just to be that ten percent happier than what you are now? Being realistic and providing some kind of assurance of what they will get out of that purchase with you. Now, I know you can't always guarantee money. You can't always guarantee happiness and success. What you can guarantee is that you're there to help them go as far as they possibly can. And that reassurance sometimes can be enough because you be enough to say, you know what, I'm as your coach, I'm going to be there every step of the way. I'm your biggest fan. And I want to help you to get there. And that could be all they need to hear as a reassurance. And of course, there's discounts and you know, sweetening their pot, throwing in extra gifts and 10% discounts if they come back and get this within 24 hours. But I don't want you to get too stuck on discounts. I don't think discounting and, and price cutting is actually the way to go. Otherwise, you're just fighting everyone else in a race to the bottom. It's like going shopping for clothes on any website at the moment. You kind of know that if you abandon the cart, that probably within you know, 10, 15 minutes, they're going to send you an email that says, hey, come back and get 10% off. And you go, yeah, I just got 10% off for absolutely nothing just because I you know, walked away from their shop and then came back. It's like walking away from the guy who's trying to sell you a used car and you go, nah, too expensive, mate. You start walking away and suddenly he wants to negotiate. That's what websites are like too. The next stage is what we call loyalty. And this is where your customers become repeat customers. And they also start casually recommending you to other people in their world. Positive experiences will always bring return customers and cross sales depending on whether you've got something which you can buy twice. Some people do services and, and products which are once in a lifetime deals, once in a lifetime products. Well, you probably won't get a, a return sale, but what you could get is a recommendation to their friends, their family, the people they love to bring them into uh, a relationship with you just like they had. This is where you can lay down incentives and loyalty programs to get people to come back. You know, the, the old coffee card trick, you know, they, they punch the coffee card to see how far along the coffee card you've got. Well, they stamp it. They've got a special stamp for it to show that, oh, yeah, you have bought five coffees, so your sixth one is free. That kind of stuff keeps people coming back. What is your kind of thing you can do? Think about what you could throw in there. What is something you can continually do? If you could say, like, to get their loyalty, you might go, you know what, we've got a, a Facebook group that you're free to join. What it will do is gives you, um, you know, if you're participating on our Facebook group and we make you a, a moderator, then you'll get, you know, 25% off everything in our store because you're one of our ambassadors, one of our fans, which takes us through to the next point. Before we do, I want to give you an idea of, 
that this loyalty stuff, I didn't really change the options here, but it's meant to say something in the terms of, you know, discount cards, loyalty cards, follow-up emails, having the ability for after-sales service. After-sales service is really important to maintain that relationship with people to make them come back again and again. The final stage then is advocacy. And this is where they really do transition from being a customer to being a fan. Now, your fans go more than just buying from you again, more than just recommending you. They actively get out there and, and, and are kind of your marketing team without paying a marketing team. They actively leave reviews for you. You love reviews. Reviews are great, especially good ones. They actively recommend you to the people around them. They're not just casually just sort of going, oh, yeah, I went shopping last week, went to this place. They're actually like, oh, my God, you've got to deal with this person because they are so good. When you get to that point, and I've got a few people who do this for me now, um, I'm so thankful for them. So what I like to do is if something comes through that, I like to give them something. You know, here's a $50, $50 gift card. Thank you so much for bringing them across. It really makes a difference to me. Sometimes they forget to do it, but I really want to start doing it. Most people don't, they're not looking for that. They're not looking to get rewarded. They're not looking to you know, be shouted out. But who doesn't like being thanked for what they've done? Who doesn't like receiving a gift that's unexpected? You don't have to incentivize that stuff necessarily. Some people are just going to be your fan because they're your fan. They're your fan because they love what you do. They love your programs. They love your, your clothing. They love your way of talking and doing things and teaching and training. So think about some brands that may be like that. I think of um, you know, brands like I've done it again with this advocacy one. <laughs> I didn't actually fill out the, the fill out the bubbles, but the um the 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 advocacy level of people who like brands like Patagonia, for instance, which is a high-end adventure wear brand. People who love Patagonia really, really love Patagonia. They will wear no other adventure wear. All their jackets, all their clothes are Patagonia. And it's because Patagonia has created something of a, a fan base through their approach to sustainability and protecting the earth. And they're very strong on that. And they donate a heck of a lot of money to that. In fact, all their, their um, the founder recently just made us, so all the profits are basically just going to go into programs. He's not, he's not going to take any profits from it because he doesn't need any money. And he feels like, well, it's time for us to just basically just, you know, walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Um, you might see brands like Harley Davidson is a very good example of this. Harley Davidson is um, a brand where, they don't have to do much advertising at all. They don't have, you know, um, New Year's sales and ends of financial year clearances and come and buy a Harley Davidson for two and a half thousand dollars off. You don't get that kind of approach from these brands. They have such big groups. In, in the case of Harley Davidson, we've got the Harley owners group, HOG. And it's like a group of hundreds of thousands of people in a Facebook group who are just all part of this community where they help each other out with tips on how to maintain, how to use, how to get the most out of their Harley Davidson. They talk about Harley Davidson dealers and mechanics and recommend people who can work on old Harley Davidsons. These are people who are not paid to be in there. They act as advocates for that. So this is where we don't necessarily have to incentivize them. Harley Davidson doesn't give them stuff to do. They just basically go, um, yeah, well, just, 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 you know, be part of our community. And that's enough to be seen as an expert in the community like that is, is a very high level of status for someone. Another um, group like that is Sephora. So not everyone lives in places where there's Sephora shops. They sell makeup, right? So a big makeup store, like our Mecca Maxima and, and Mecca, whatever they are, that, that just, a, a store that sells lots of makeup from different brands, right? So this particular place, they have uh, something like 6 million people in, a, in this group on Facebook. And this little community of, not little, this huge community on Facebook is not even run by Sephora. It's basically they've, they've allocated people who become their ambassadors, who become their helpers, their moderators, and they run the community for them. So what is happening now is that in the, in the form of things like gifts and incentives and that sort of thing, Sephora is spending nearly $1 billion a year, $1 billion incentivizing this community and helping it to run better. Not by putting all the ads out there on TV and radio. They don't even advertise on TV and radio. What they do, though, they invest into the community of people who support them, making fans of them. Now, I'm not saying you need to find a billion dollars because that's not probably going to happen this year. So we probably go, what can we do? 
well, we can just encourage people to become partners with us. People who have shown they love what we do, that we've got a level of trust with them and they've got a level of trust with you. They become part of your, your team, your marketing team. Wouldn't that be nice? So we've got all this stuff lined up. We've got all these parts of this journey going on. How do we actually do stuff on that journey? How do we, you know, how do we work with it? How do we make it work for us? So if you're looking at the awareness stage, that's that first early stage where they don't know who you are, the most important thing to do is get attention. I'm talking about you know, making sure people know who you are. They know exactly who you are. They don't have to guess it. You just want to be noticed. It could be great TikToks. It could be amazing Facebook ads. It could be really well-written stories on LinkedIn or Medium or other kinds of places. You could be making some unforgettable like YouTube videos that really cut through to people. And then what you do as part of that, to go beyond just simply getting attention, you've got to highlight the problem that people are having that you can solve. Example could be, let's just take a, let's just take a life coach as an example. So a life coach would be, okay, we're getting attention by saying something like, you can do better than this in life. You can be so much more than this in life. You could be climbing mountains. You could be achieving this. You could be earning more, but you're not going to do it this year. You know why? because it involves getting change. So there's like a little video, like a scenario of video. It gets attention, draws you in. You go, oh, I do want all those things. And yeah, I might have a bit of a problem with change. I might need to address that a little bit. So then what you do is highlight the problem for them and say, you want to do all these things, but you don't have the time. You want to do all these things, but you just don't have the money. You want to do all these things, but there's this little voice inside your head that keeps saying no. Does that sound familiar? And by doing that, you're creating an empathetic connection with someone. They're now starting to not just see this thing that you can do and this product that you sell or this service that you have, but they see what it means to them. They draw a line, a straight line between what you're doing and how they feel. People don't buy things logically. They usually have a really emotional reason to buy, especially big ticket things, especially things that are not bread and milk and bags of rice. This is where they're buying big ticket things that are you know, not commodities. They're things that are so important that they're going to buy that make a change in their life or somehow are going to impact their life in some way. They need to feel that connection. They need to feel that it's relevant to them. People, the number one reason, and I learned this through the work I've done with, I met it with Facebook, is that the number one reason why people want to watch a video or they want to um, go forward and find out more about a product or a service is because it's relevant. When it's relevant to them, it's premium to them. Anything that's specifically pointing at a problem that I have, whether it's cheap or expensive, immediately becomes known to my head as being premium. And we all want premium things, don't we? We want good things, nice things. So that highlighting of the problem by making it super relevant to that person doesn't just get the attention, but it keeps it. And then they want to move on to the next level and go, well, what do I want next? I want to, I want to find out more about this product. But first, you have to get that attention and get that empathetic connection. You can do it through TV ads, radio ads, TikToks. Instagram posts, Instagram stories, Instagram reels, Facebook reels. That's one of the highest growth areas on Facebook and Instagram right now is Facebook reels. They're doing gangbusters. If you can get some, some Facebook reels in there, you're going to get some attention all of a sudden. I'm about to start doing the next, that's why I've got all my fresh, fancy lighting in here. So I'm about to start doing a whole lot of these kinds of things. And there's also the word of mouth. People learn about you from word of mouth. Now, you don't have a lot of control over word of mouth, but you're really, really like specific and super targeted about what your message is about your brand and your, your, your products. And you're in that position where you can go, yes, I can have a message that keeps going out there from other people who are my advocates, people who are fans of what I do. The consideration stage then is where you introduce your point of difference. So it's not just enough to say, I'm highly relevant to you. I'm also highly attention grabbing, but you're saying that actually I'm different to everybody else. I'm way better and here's why. And you do that for basically saying, what is different about you from the IT guys that I'm, I'm working with to help them to get their business into a better position and better marketed is by pointing to, not to what they do, but who they are. They are 
former students, fresh graduates from, from Charles Darwin University that are forming this business, not as a way for them to grow a, a big corporate gigantic brand, but they're doing it because they want to, <clears throat> they want to be finding a pathway for other students who graduate to come in there where they can be nurtured, where they can be taught and trained, and then taught to start their own businesses, not just to come in and work for this IT company, but actually start competing companies to this IT company. It sounds crazy, but it is what makes them different. And that story needs to be told to help grow them. So I say, well, in the consideration stage, that point of difference is absolutely vital because that's what separates them from every other IT company that sounds the same, looks the same, has the same branding, has the same features and benefits as everyone else. The next thing is education and credibility. And this is where you can educate people through what your point of difference is. Educate people through what the benefits are to them of what it is you're selling. Not just this great big long list of, oh, we do this and we do this and we do this and we do this and we do this. Then we go, because we know that you want to be able to get more done in your day, we've got this thing. Because we know that you just want to be generally happy in your life, we've got this thing. Just because we know you're a busy mum and you want to be able to get take care of the kids, get dinner done and actually everything done, plus have time to sit down and read your favorite book at night, we've got this. So you're always linking that benefit to what that person wants through to the product that you've got or the feature of the product that you've got to sell. And the credibility comes from things like testimonials, people who have said great things about you before, things that show your education, perhaps. So you can say, oh, I went to this university. We're members of this particular organization. We've got this certification. Those sort of areas of credibility really help to be introducing the people at this stage of the game, the consideration stage of the game. Next one up. You know, it's like through uh, LinkedIn is great for this. If you've got services, um, emails, if you can get emails out to people to explain the, the details of what you do. And also an email newsletter, and I've learned this from my 10,700 10, subscribers on email now, is that the, the email way of doing things is going to be great because what it allows you to do is to expand on your knowledge. You can sort of touch on your knowledge in social media, but a blog or a YouTube video or a LinkedIn article or a Facebook post that's longer or an email can contain so much more detail about what it is you're doing and why someone should trust you to go on to this next level, which is the conversion where they want to buy from you. They are actively going out there to buy and you're making it easy for them to do that. So that's just the ease of transaction. That's giving them incentives. It could be discounts. It could be gifts. It could be, you know, a last sort of spread of reasons why they should buy from you that aren't necessarily to do with incentives, just nailing down those benefits of buying from you, the benefit of dealing with you, the benefit of your product or your service over everybody else out there in the competition. Makes sense, I hope. Then we move on to the next slide. So a lot of this stuff happens in your website, all that credibility stuff, all that sort of incentives and ease of the transaction all come down to how good your website is at doing the job that your website is meant to do to get people done and through the process. So then you're not in this position where they don't know what to do next. They do know what to do next because you just led them there. You've got a, a, a website that takes them exactly where they're supposed to be. The loyalty part of the program then is follow-up, my worst thing. I'm terrible at it. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I've got a customer relationship management system that helps me to do it. And, and a big reminder list that comes up in my, in my email, because I would always lose it. I'd always, oh, terrible. So the loyalty side of it means that you've got to follow up. You've got to have some kind of follow-up that allows people to understand what's next, um, what you've done for them, what you can do for them, the service options available to them, other things they can buy, incentives for them to come back again, incentives for them to leave a Google review or a Facebook Facebook review or something or to post and tag you, giving that follow-up means that you're not just saying goodbye at the, at, the, at the sales desk and saying, yeah, see you later. Good luck with your life. You're saying, no, I'm happy to be there to help support you through the use of this product or this service. And then if something goes wrong, I want you to feel comfortable to come and approach me. Now, I know we don't want to create that kind of rework all the time, do we? But what we need to do is make it at least look like we're willing to do that. Whether people take that up or not, well, that's neither here nor there. The fact is that you need to do the follow-up. You need to provide some incentive for people to come back to you. Otherwise, why would they? They'll just drift off to somewhere else. Unless they have this, they have this insanely good experience with your product they're not necessarily going to come back to you unless you ask them to. So that's where you can reach out to people again through Facebook. You can reach out to them through posts on things like um, 
to to LinkedIn. Uh, then you can look at things like uh, emails. So so having them on an email list, so they're always receiving your updates and your specials and and the things that you're up to and the new things they might possibly buy. I like the idea of things like a customer review panels. I like to be able to have people come and say, "Hello, um, I'm from this this this. I'm from I bought from this business or I did this thing," and getting advice from people to to help you to improve. Because if you just go down this whole thing of going, oh yeah, thank you for shopping with us. Here's a link for a 5% discount next time you shop with us. Boring, 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 yawn, yawn, yawn. It becomes really pointless. It doesn't become like it's anything that's any different to what anyone else is doing. It just becomes the same old, same old. But if we had those review panels, this customer advisory panel at this advocacy level, then you've got people who are definitely buying into what you do. They love you so much. They will volunteer their time to help you to make things better because they want to see you succeed. These people aren't just customers who are happy. These are raving fans. They will go to the ends of the earth to tell people about how cool you are. So to help them, you've got to have shareable content, things that are easy for them to share. Give them access to special events. Give them access to meetings, Zoom calls that you're allowed to, to you bring them in to say, hey, we're going to ask a bunch of you, just five of you and our most highly valued customers you know, to tell us what, what went right and what went wrong. And what we like to do is pay you $50 for your time with a gift card to our store. And I go, oh my God, yes, I definitely want $50 to spend more money on the job. Oh my God, let's, let us in, let us in, let us in. These are raving fans. These people love you. They will do anything to work with you. So that could be in a form of you know, special events and meetings that you invite them into that others aren't necessarily part of. It could be gifts that you give them, like the $50 voucher, anything like that that's going to help them to, to help you to keep them as fans forever. They'll never leave your side because they'll always then see you as the place they want to go to. So wrapping up. You've got to market at every stage of the journey. It's no use just getting people to know who you are and then hoping that hoping they're going to buy from you. You've got to market to them at every stage of that journey. Awareness, consideration, con uh, conversion, and then into the loyalty and advocacy levels as well. Be aware, though, that people have different needs along the way. They're going to have different levels of communication and different styles of, 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 of communication they are expecting and wanting. Don't be too pushy because no one likes to be pushy. At the end, you might nudge them across just gently and say, hey, I haven't seen you for a while, but pop on our website. I've got a few things you might be interested in. That's a bit different than coming up to them and saying, look, could you just buy this already? We've been talking for two and a half years. I want to make a sale. That's not going to work on anybody. Use the right tools at the right times. Facebook ads probably aren't good for um, you know people who are right at that end of it where they're going to buy from either you or someone else. You're not going to be able to target close enough to be able to get that ad in front of them. But Facebook ads at the very beginning of the journey, getting the attention, empathizing and showing that here's the problem we know you're having. We might have a problem. We might have a solution to that. That kind of marketing is great. TV, radio, really good at creating that awareness. Then you use different tools to go down the journey. Email marketing could be what you use to, to reach people who are further down that track. Um, and also don't stop at the sale. It's very tempting to make the sale and never talk to that person again, never reach out to them again. But it can be a beautiful thing when you can go, hey, thanks for giving us your email address and buying this product. Just wanted to drop in and say hi, see if everything's going right and uh, make you aware that we've actually got a bit of a sales event coming up. You may or may not be interested in it, but if you click on this link, you can see more about it. Hoping to see you again soon. Love us. And then you've got that ability to be able to reach people who are a bit beyond just simply customers and they want to become fans. So we're at the end of this webinar. If you want to know more about this and you haven't already participated in the Digital Solutions Program, $44 for three hours of coaching and three one-hour sessions, great value. Plus you get to access all of our workshops and webinars for as long as you like. Now this program ends at the end of March. So you've got to make sure you get yourself done with these three hours before then because I'd hate to see you miss out on such a great deal. Get onto this address, digitalsolutions.businessstation dot com dot au finally that's my contact details please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about this webinar thank you for participating there's quite a few of you in the room tonight so i really appreciate you taking time out of your businesses to work on your businesses for now though i'd like to say 
Thank you and goodbye. And I'll see you in the next one of these webinars with Business Station. And forget if you need to see all those Business Station webinars, see the list, digitalsolutions.businessstation.com.au. Thank you and have a great night.